When it comes to cursed books throughout history, I feel like grimoires are kind of low hanging fruit at this point, and I didn't include any on today's edition of Horrid Literature, so if that's what you're looking for, fret not, I've chatted plenty about them in the past, and I do encourage binge watching those videos. But back to today's discussions before I get sidetracked. So, question for everybody, what book do you think will absolutely be on today's list? Let me know in the comments, and let's see if you can predict the future without cheating. If cursing power were based solely on a book's size, the Codex Gigas, otherwise known as the Devil's Bible, would probably be the most dangerous book ever written. Weighing in at a whopping 165 pounds and measuring about 3 feet in height, the roughly 800 year old tome is thought to be the world's largest surviving medieval manuscript. Codex Gigas literally means a giant book. It doesn't get any more simple than that, folks. The manuscript's exact origins have been lost to time, but historians believe it was written at some point between 1204 and 1230 in the Kingdom of Bohemia, part of what would become the Czech Republic. According to the National Library of Sweden, the book was owned by at least three different monasteries before Emperor Rudolf II added it to his private collection, which would also soon include the Voynich Manuscript in 1594. Now, I won't necessarily be talking about that manuscript today, but it's an approximately 600-year-old mystery that continues to stump scholars, cryptographers, physicists, and computer scientists. That one is a roughly only 240 page medieval codex written in an indecipherable language, brimming with bizarre drawings of esoteric plants, nude women, and astrological symbols. It defies classification, much less comprehension. So not cursed, but still a good mystery. Sorry, I know. Sidetracked again, ADHD is fun. Back to the Codex we go. In 1648, it was claimed by the Swedish army during the Thirty Years' War and taken to Stockholm, and has been housed in Sweden's National Library since 1768. While many illuminated texts were produced by teams of scribes, scholars believe the Codex Gigas is the work of a single copyist. Written entirely in Latin, the book contains both the Old and New Testaments, along with Czech and Jewish history texts, an encyclopedia with information on geometry, legal matters and entertainment, among other topics, medical stuff, hundreds of obituaries, several several magic spells, and a calendar. Just a good catch-all anthology if you ask me. You got a little bit of everything. The book's sinister reputation stems from a full-color portrait of the devil contained in its pages, and a legend about how the image got there. So if we're going to consult the folklore, the book is the work of a monk. Possibly, let's see if I get this right, Hermanus Hermitus, or Herman the Recluse, who had broken his vows and been sentenced to be walled up alive in the monastery. He had struck a deal to save himself. If, over the course of a single night, he could write a book containing all the world's knowledge, his life would be spared. When he realized the task was impossible, because no SHIT Sherlock, the monk sold his soul to the devil, who helped him finish the book and signed it with the now infamous portrait. Other versions of the story say the monk added the illustration as a gesture of gratitude for Satan's assistance, but nevertheless, the portrait is there, and boy oh boy is it off-putting to look at. There are several tales of misfortune attached to the codex, but the curse seems to be fairly benign, when you consider the book was apparently also co-written by Beelzebub. One legend dating back to at least 1858 maintains that a guard was institutionalized after being accidentally locked in Sweden's National Library overnight, and he was supposedly found under a table the next morning, claiming to have seen the Codex join a procession of books as they danced through the air. Yeah, not a book I plan on visiting anytime soon. Written in the early 1600s by Martin de Leon Cardenas, the orphan story is a novel about a young Spaniard who heads to the Americas in search of fortune. Well, it may sound like a normal adventure story, and an outlier amongst the magical books I'm about to talk about today. A major darkness lurks within its pages that led to the novel not being published until 2018. The first draft was a 328 page manuscript that was slightly yellowed, a little bit worn, a little bit aged, missing a couple of pages. Which, you know, on the surface sounds pretty tame, but you've got to assume otherwise if I'm making a point of it. It is handwritten in a decorative style reflective of the Golden or Imperial Age. I'm not super sure. The New Age print takes on a more modern bound look, featuring artwork from the original manuscript on the front in a rather plain book front past that. Belinda Peliasos, a Peruvian scholar who edited the book for two years, says that she was warned by multiple people about this manuscript. It was first set to appear in 1621 under the pen name of Andres de Leon, but never made it to the press due to the presidential atmosphere at the time in Sicily. If you know, you know. The manuscript then sat in the Hispanic Society of America until 1965 when Belinda rediscovered it. She learned about the many attempts to publish the story, giving rise to rumors that malevolent energy lurked among the pages, causing the people who worked on it to pass. In an interview, she commented on the reported deaths, saying one was from a strange disease, another in a car accident, and something, something, something else for the other. Belinda had also heard from other professors she was working with to publish the book, one who specialized in colonial letters from the Andean regions in Mexico, who was named Raquel Chang Rodriguez. Raquel's letters describe how Antonio Rodriguez Manino and William C. Bryant both died before finishing their editions of the book, and that's why the manuscript is believed to be cursed or bewitched. They told her that the book was cursed. And the reason it had taken them so long to publish that was, well, if you work on it, you're gonna die. 
in some sort of weird, mysterious way. Did the powers that be not want the ancient script out in the world? Note to self, don't go within 10 feet of the book. Not worth it. Here's an obvious inclusion into our list today, the Necronomicon. Look, I should get brownie points somewhere for holding out for a year before talking about this job. Inspired by an HP Lovecraft story, this book was published in the 70s by an anonymous author, only identified by the pen name Simon, believed to actually be Peter Lavenda. but can't prove that. The first editions, of which I'm not kidding, only 666 copies were released, were bound in leather, but later on it would be published in paperback, becoming an immediate bestseller. In this version's prologue, Simon claims that this is no fictional book, but a translation of a Greek manuscript containing the Necronomicon. The introduction to the book, which is about 80 pages of the 263, is the only part that Simon claims were written. It relates how Simon and his associates were introduced to a Greek translation of the Necronomicon, I love saying that word, by a mysterious monk. Simon claims that after experimenting with the text, Text, they verified that the work is a genuine collection of magical rituals that predates most known religions, and warns that anyone attempting to use this might unleash dangerous forces. In addition to an introduction, the book uses a framed story titled The Testimony of the Mad Arab. The testimony is in two parts, forming a prologue and an epilogue to the core. The author describes himself as, you guessed it, Mad Arab. I'll just call it Mad. The prologue explains how Mad first came to discover the dark secret that he's recording, accidentally witnessing an arcane ritual performed by a cult that worships Tiamat, in which both the demons Cthulhu and Humwawa are conjured. In the epilogue, Mad is haunted by premonitions of his gruesome death. He realizes that the horrors of the Necronomicon are enraged and seek revenge upon him for revealing their existence to the world. He is unable to sign his work and thus remains nameless. This version mixes pseudo-Sumerian mythology with Lovecraft's universe, and it includes rituals that supposedly allow the reader to summon the gods and demons of these myths. It has also been linked to the Satanic Church, as it kind of alludes to Aleister Crowley's teachings. And if you know anything about that name, you'll understand why that's a name to be worried about being associated with anything. Ever heard of Tomino's Hell? Rather than a full book, bear with me here, it's a cursed poem included in Sakin, a poem compilation dating back to 1919 by a Japanese poet and songwriter. It tells the journey of a Tomino, a young boy who has been sent to hell after he committed an unforgivable sin. The poem later served as an inspiration for a film called Pastoral to Die in the Country. The filmmaker died nine years later, and well, the poem was blamed for it. Since then, it has become an instant urban legend, suggesting that anybody who reads the poem will either die in a couple of days, or eh, be haunted by Tomino's spirit. Six one way, half a dozen the other, right? And finally for today, the Book of Soiga is an occult text that dates back to at least the 1500s. We only know about it because it was once owned by John Dee, a famous 16th century polymath whose fields of study and expertise included mathematics, physics, chemistry, and astronomy. Dee was also an occultist who was particularly interested in communicating with angels. This book must have been irresistible to him. Besides magical spells and writings about demonology and astrology, the text includes the names and genealogies of angels. Look, it's a nice exchange from the usual books of demons I hear about. Let me have this one. According to Benjamin Woolley's D biography, The Queen's Conjurer, D believed the book contained an ancient, even divine message written in the language originally spoken to Adam. In other words, the true unspoiled word of God. I know a lot of people who would love to see that. It also includes 36 cryptic tables that remained undeciphered for centuries. D attempted to crack their code with the help of Edward Kelly, a crystal gazer who convinced D he could channel the voices of angels. Kelly sometimes spelled his name by K-E-L-L-Y instead of being K-E-L-L-E-Y, or went by Edward Talbot. Having aliases was probably helpful to the supposed medium, who had reportedly been convicted of counterfeiting and might have had his ears cut off as punishment. According to Sky History, Dee was so eager to talk to angels that when Kelly told him the angels wanted the two men to swap wives for an evening as payment for celestial communication, Dee was like, heck yes. Nine months later, Theodore was born. Yeah, well, that's something you don't hear about every day. Using Kelly as a go-between, Dee dialed up the archangel Uriel and asked him if the Book of Soiga was a real deal. Uriel, speaking through Kelly, assured him that it was, but told him that only the archangel Michael was authorized to translate the tables, but he wasn't available, a busy schedule or something. This exchange might be the source of the Book of Soiga's reputation as a cursed book, or as it is sometimes known, the book that kills. At one point, Dee mentioned to Uriel that he'd been told he'd die within two and a half years if he ever read the encoded text. Uriel assured Dee that he'd live for more than 100 years. Dee died in 1608 at the age of 81. The book changed hands a couple of times before vanishing from historical record. Fast forward 300 years, summer of 1994, Deborah Harkness had just finished her doctoral dissertation and was browsing through the catalog at Oxford's Bodleian Library when she found a reference to the text in question. She had the book brought up and soon found herself staring at the holy grail of Dee's scholarship. The experience inspired her first novel, The Discovery of Witches, which kicked off a best-selling trilogy and has since been adapted for television, which 
love to see it. In 1998, mathematician Jim Reeds cracked the code of its mysterious tables. Reeds discovered a pattern involving the frequency and position of certain letters in relation to the other letters, or in his words, a letter is obtained by counting a certain number of letters after the letter immediately above it in the table. Make of that what you will. Reeds came up with a set of mathematical formulae that allowed him to decipher the tables, each of which turned out to be based on a six letter code word. But we still don't know the meaning of those code words or what messages the tables were meant to communicate, or if there even is one, maybe someday. And that's it for me once again, folks. I've been Alexa, your resident Yuki Spooky girly. And if you enjoyed my ramblings today, could you help us out by giving this video a like, subscribing if you aren't already, hit the bell for more cursed book discussions from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos, and I'll see y'all next time, you lovely spooky people.